Welcome, everybody, on this uh, lovely, if cooler, day than we've been having lately. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Helen Cooper, who is speaking to us today on this uh, intriguing topic. Helen uh, is a Queen's grad. She uh, received a BSc in chemistry and mathematics and then worked briefly at Procter at Gamble early in her career. She then spent, uh, I, I love reading these curriculum vitae because yeah. our speakers have such fascinating careers that I think there's a message for all of us about the, uh, the fact that most careers of our distinguished speakers are certainly not linear. In any event, Helen, after graduating and working in the private sector, moved to CUSO for a two-year stint in Tanzania, working at a girls' boarding school. Um, she then went back to school and uh, got an MSc at the London School of Economics in econometrics. I don't know what that is, but it sounds important. Uh, she came back to Kingston with two young children who went to school with my children, actually and was subsequently uh, elected a municipal councillor in Kingston in 1980. She was Kingston's first woman mayor from 1988 to 1993, following which she spent three years as chair of the Ontario Municipal Board. In the early 90s, she was president of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, a member of the Premier's Council on Health Strategy and the Ontario Roundtable on Environment and the Economy. From 2001 to 6, she was a member of the Advisory Council on the of the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. Talk about lateral moves. And from 2006 to 2014, was manager in the Ministry of Community and Social Services, most recently with program delivery for adult developmental services. She then retired and has traveled both in North America and abroad. She's pursuing a long-held goal, which I find fascinating, of complete, uh, completing Route 66 in stages. Uh, she's a distinguished fellow of the School of Policy Studies and also is president of OASIS Senior Supportive Living. So Helen, welcome and thank you. And we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, and uh, uh, an honor and a delight to be introduced by a very old friend. Uh, not in the CV was uh, the explanation. I worked as a research assistant in the Department of Economics when I very first got back to Kingston many years ago. And uh, the then uh, one of the profs in the economics department, Rod Fraser, who went on to great and wonderful things as president of the University of Alberta, amongst other things, uh, had a project from the Canadian Heart Foundation, which was in essence trying to assemble data on medical research in cardiovascular disease uh, to be able to make mount a much better case to the Canadian government that they were losing money in real terms, which they were. And uh, I sat in a little office in Dunning Hall uh, going through reams and reams of uh, titles of medical research projects, trying to figure out which ones were cardiovascular and which ones weren't. Uh, the advantage I had was a chemistry degree, so the uh, biochemical stuff didn't scare me too much. Uh, but at some point, I said to Rod Fraser, I need help, big help, in uh, figuring out whether I'm completely off the trolley or not here. So uh, at the time, uh, a senior uh, cardiologist at Queen's offered the help of one of his residents to look over uh, my what were in those days file cards. <laughs> and uh, guess who it was? Uh, so that was my introduction to David Walker. And, <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was supremely helpful to me. And as you probably know well by now, David has a phenomenal sense of humor. So it made my somewhat dry research project a lot more palatable. And I wasn't too far off the trolley, was I? <laughs> Uh, in any case, uh, we're, uh, I'll talk about my, my latest interest, and it isn't just because I have white hair. The, um, it's circumstance yet again, as David said, careers are seldom linear, and that's certainly true for mine, both professionally and as a volunteer. Uh, any day I pick up the newspaper, I find something relevant, and uh, I'm still 
like to read uh, paper print in the morning with my cup of coffee. I found one today. Uh, it's called Overcrop Overcrowding Could Prompt Reopening of a Hospital. And it's talking about a hospital in the Greater Toronto Area, Humber, that was closed in favor of a new building. But there are so many people now who require, require alternative level of care, ALC, uh, as is known amongst uh, those who work in hospitals, these are very elderly patients who really shouldn't be in acute care hospitals. They should be in uh, residential care, institutional care of some sort, or palliative care, and uh, there's nowhere for them to go. So it would appear that uh, there is a continuing crisis, particularly, sorry, I didn't mean to yell into the mic, particularly in the GTA where population is exploding. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is what's really going on in this country in terms of our demographics, just give you a quick overview, and then uh, what is a potential solution. It's only one of many, many, many potential solutions, but I would offer the advice that uh, only small solutions, often community-based, are really the only salvation that we have. And I say that from having worked in a large ministry in Toronto. <laughs> now, first of all, uh, demographic pyramids are always really interesting to look at. I'm not sure if the mic's in the right place here or not. The, uh, there's, uh, I just was just going to look at Ontario versus Canada. Uh, population pyramids tell you an awful lot. I, people have probably already seen them on numerous occasions if you haven't. Uh, I highly advise that you look at them when any any time you're dealing with anything with demographics. You can see uh, it shows you both men and women of all age groups uh, going from zero to 100 plus. Uh, the women are on the right, the men on the left. You can look at Ontario and the dark blue outline uh, is Canada. And you can see that Ontario looks just like Canada, almost exactly. Uh, I then thought, oh well, I'll uh, my experience is in Ontario, I can't uh, adequately speak beyond that. But I thought, oh, I'll just have a little look at what else is going on. And I looked at British Columbia, and it's baby boom a little bigger, and uh, not as many children, uh, but not totally dissimilar. <coughs> then I looked at Nova Scotia and Saskatchewan, and, went, and Nova Scotia is uh, so very similar to all the other uh, Atlantic provinces. I just picked it because it has the largest population. You can, uh, you can see, I hope you can anyway, those, the blue is somewhat faint. Uh, the baby boom is huge in Nova Scotia, uh, and there aren't as many children. Uh, and you, then you look at Saskatchewan, the baby boom is smaller, uh, and uh, there are a lot more children. So what's the solution in Ontario uh, is perhaps not the same as a, as a priority in Saskatchewan. Uh, what is a priority in terms of aging in Ontario is even more of a priority in the Atlantic provinces. So uh, wherever uh, you as uh, MPA grads end up working, I think it's really important for you to the first thing you do is look at the demographic profile, which will give you some idea of what the priorities of the particular, if you are working in the public service, what the priority of that government will be. So uh, I went to Stats Canada, of which I am a big fan, and uh, I found out uh, what I've written down here. Uh, women are more numerous among the seniors population than men. Well, I think we always thought that. Uh, but uh, it shows you there. I, I put it in a graph on the next slide as well, so it's a, a bit easier to look at. Uh, the baby boom, uh, any of you who have ever read uh, David Foote's literature, he was, uh, well, he's a professor emeritus at U of T and a demographer who became a very popular s public speaker. Uh, well, he wrote something a few years ago called Boom Bust and Echo, and he spends a great deal of time talking about the influence of the baby boom in Canada. 
particularly that Canada is one of only four countries that had a baby boom, namely the US, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, Europe, uh, at the end of the Second World War, wasn't particularly concerned with propagating. It was, uh, uh, they were more concerned with dealing with the ramifications of having been in an intense warfare. And of course, we know that, uh, read frequently, that uh, Japan is a very, very aging population, much more dramatically than our own. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, in, it, it, in other words, uh, we seniors aren't going to go away anytime soon. Uh, it's only when we get to 2061 that we start to see a decline, and that's when the baby boomers are gone. And here it is in graphic form. Uh, now, what, what does it suggest? I said uh, the generational split is less dramatic for men than women, uh, as you can see. Uh, I said there's good news for increasing longevity, longevity for senior men uh, than has previously been the case. Now, I would defer to somebody like David, who may have some very good explanations for that. Uh, I suggest uh, uh, superb cardiovascular surgery may well be uh, an important component of this. Uh, uh, there are other things we could think of. The, uh, I said increasing policy challenges for the foreseeable future and addressing the aged population without disadvantaging youth. Uh, I worry always that it's going to end up as a, uh, a challenge. Uh, old people are getting all the consideration, young people aren't getting any. Uh, are uh, therefore uh, a, re a resentment between one generation and the next, and I hope that doesn't happen. And I guess uh, I do have some consoling words in this that I, I trust this will not happen. So uh, the oldest old are what we really want to look at. Uh, the, ca the little bit of the Globe and Mail newspaper that I read to you at the beginning of my talk uh, is about the oldest old. And that's the folks who are, uh, I speak from personal experience, as do many of us who are in the younger old age, uh, about the experience of our parents. And uh, uh, no surprise, I've already talked to a couple of people before this session has talked about rising interest in provision of palliative care, for instance. Uh, it, population demand is leading this. And, uh, uh, but the oldest old uh, are largely going to end up in institutions unless there are alternatives. Now, uh, what's happening with all these old folks well, uh, most of us uh, find if we go into those home care stores of Shoppers Drug Mart to be profoundly depressing. Uh, there are, you know, lifts and uh, depends and <laughs> all these less than sexy things that we'd sooner not have to look at. Uh, but uh, the market is responding. The market is saying to elderly people, uh, shopping uh, doesn't have to be as dreary as you might think it, should, it could be. And so uh, c there are such slogans as customers want to age more powerfully, not just comfortably. Uh, businesses are increasingly grappling with demands of an aging population. Additional products offered apart from the joyless necessities, uh, which is what the home care stores are full of at the moment, and they're offering aromatherapy kits, jazzy socks, as you can see, lightweight padded dumbbells, and travel accessories. So where do people live? Now, again, after I uh, have talked about uh, alternative levels of care and people in acute care hospitals who are clogging up beds, uh, uh, the uh, a living, this may give you an, a distorted impression of what current living conditions are. Uh, and uh, again, it shows you uh, that uh, most people, uh, even uh, fairly elderly, are living in private households. 
Uh, so we don't have to think that everybody is living in some form of institutional care. Uh, you can see even by age 85 that 65% of women and 77% of men are not living in institutions. And then when you look, my data is a little bit out of date, but it's the best I could do uh, with what's uh, publicly available, is that um, women living alone, uh, as you can see, uh, as you age, you're more likely to be living alone, but not in a nursing home. So the major alternative is a collective dwelling, which may be a nursing home or a residence for senior citizens. Uh, most of us don't want to go there, uh, I think I can safely say. I see nodding of heads amongst my contemporaries. <laughs> uh, uh, I, um, and uh, so, so what, uh, what can we offer as alternatives? Uh, again, it's saying for all seniors living in collective dwellings, most, uh, seven out of ten, are women. So uh, from what I've been concentrating on lately, I'm certainly dealing with a female population much more than a male population. Well, I went to Kai High, again, another extremely important source of information on Canadian health care demographic. Uh, and uh, they're mo they did a huge study in 2011, published in 2011, on uh, aging. Uh, well, I found some very interesting things here, uh, always dangerous to assume. Uh, seniors are typically frequent users of healthcare services, that I would believe. Uh, system spending more on them than any other segment. Current seniors are living longer than seniors from previous generations, that I think we know. Uh, and we're healthier than ever before. And with increasing age, the differences in capacity to carry out activities and chronic conditions become more prevalent. Now, this is where I was surprised. Uh, it said healthcare spending on seniors is four times that of non-senior adults in absolute terms. But it says the rate of spending growth for seniors was actually lower in 10 years than the rates for non-senior adults. So I, I don't know how to explain that, but I think it's an interesting and quite optimistic trend. Uh, and it points out the increasing number of chronic conditions rather than increasing age drives primary health care. So how do we deal with chronic illness? Now, uh, we still, as I'm reiterating now, the vast majority of seniors live in private households and then they do so because they get home care. Uh, now the home care may be provided by the provincial government through the, now the LINs in Ontario, the lo uh, local L -H -I -N, health integrated networks uh, or it may be people just pay people to come into their houses if they can afford to. Or it may be that a son, a daughter primarily, uh, comes and helps out, which as you can see is 80% of the case. And of course you will see repeated articles about the informal care network and about the sandwich generation and about women in particular who are trying to hold down a job, trying to raise teenagers and or young adults and trying to keep mom and dad on the straight and narrow. And uh, it's, it's a huge challenge in our society. And it's saying here 32% of informal caregivers give more than 21 hours of care per week, which is extremely limiting on their own lives uh, in terms of their uh, career aspirations. So uh, what are we going to do about this? What solution can we, uh, I'm only going to offer one to you, but I think it's one that's working out pretty well. And I think it's one that can be replicated. Uh, what helps to keep especially aged seniors, healthy and happy and living independently. 
That's the challenge. Then the alternative care beds are not required to the same extent. And then the a role of the caregiver becomes less arduous. Well, uh, Harvard has studied adult development uh, longitudinally for almost 80 years, uh, which is fairly impressive through four directors. Uh, the, <laughs> It's the original study group. Uh, it, I, just, I read it, it, this article that I'm quoting to you. I, I, it's quite entertaining. Uh, the, uh, the original study group included John Kennedy and Ben Bradley, who people will recognize that name from Watergate fame of the Washington Post. Uh, the, uh, uh, so it was a fairly selective group they started following. These were men from Harvard. I, I think we would argue that's probably a fairly privileged group, not uh, representative of the entire American population. But even so, the study has continued and has expanded over the years. And the current psychiatrist, whose name is here, uh, Robert Waldinger, uh, who's talked about in the article and who is, I've quoted a TED, TED talk as well, which I have not watched, I intend to, is that uh, good genes are nice, but joy is better. Uh, how happy we are in our relationships is a more powerful influence on our health. Loneliness kills, and uh, he's claiming it's as powerful as smoking or alcoholism. Well, look at the stats that I was telling you about. Look at how many, particularly women, old women, are living on their own. Think of people who are ending up in ALC uh, with uh, all sorts of conditions, including depression. And are there things we can do to prevent that from happening in the first place? Uh, Well, uh, here's uh, another article, just stuff I found right before I came here. Seniors want walkability too. Millennials aren't the only ones seeking connected, accessible urban living. Well, I've just moved into an apartment on Ontario Street. I don't, those of you who are familiar with Kingston, some of you I know are quite new to the city. Ontario Street is that downtown street right by the water. Uh, it's an enclave of apartment blocks. And all you have to do is go to the Common Market, which is this lovely little coffee shop on the corner of William and Ontario Streets, and watch the world go by. And it is a world of elderly people. Uh, if you stand at the other end of Ontario Street, you'll see the other world go by, which is uh, mostly medical and graduate students heading off to Queens. So that's the demographic of Ontario Street. And, uh, so, uh, an apartment on Ontario Street, uh, the cheapest rents for a decent sized apartment are at least $2,000 a month. Uh, so, that's immediately limiting. Uh, only people who can afford those kind of rents are going to be people who can live there. So, what we see are some very elderly seniors, but they're in a group of people who have a fairly large income, comparatively speaking. Uh, so they're living in these places, really nice apartments, mostly new, one condominium, uh, well, three condominiums, and they're walking to the market, and they're walking to the pharmacy, and they're walking to the common market, and uh, they're walking to the screening room cinema, and I can go on and on and on. So, uh, those aren't the folks that uh, are most in need of attention because they can afford to do and live uh, happily for the most part themselves. Uh, enjoy exercise, enjoy community activity, and so on. So, if we're going to address the problems of aging, it's not the folks living down there that we want to look at. Uh, not that I want to write them off either, but I'm just simply saying they aren't the priority for what we're trying to do here. What we're looking for is lower as opposed to higher income, people living alone, 
uh, people's availability for in-home supports, people's availability of informal care, and so on down the list. All the things that lead, when they don't have them, lead to isolation, depression, and illness. If we can develop an effective model, both in terms of outcomes and costs, then there would be several willing partners besides the seniors themselves. Obviously, the Provincial Ministry of uh, Health and Long-Term Care, uh, municipalities, don't forget for a minute, the uh, municipal interest in all of this. Municipalities operate social housing directly, and municipalities operate long-term care facilities. In Kingston, it's something called Rito Crest, which is over on Rito Street, again, right downtown. Uh, and it's a large, significant, expensive operation. Uh, community not-for-profit organizations such as the United Way, such as service clubs, such as, the, in this case, the Council on Aging, and private landlords. This is a particularly interesting. For the example I'm about to give you, and I'm conscious of the time, I'd better get moving quickly, uh, the, pro the role of the private landlord is critical. So, this is what, it, uh, the, the small solution that I offer you to today. Uh, and it's interesting, I've talked to a couple of people I've known for years uh, who are engaged in uh, issues uh, not dissimilar to what I've talked about, particularly with aging populations, and everybody's heard of OASIS. It's a very small age, uh, organization but it's uh, gained a great deal of prominence in the organization, in the, in the community. Uh, I was invited to join the board a year ago after saying I would never join another volunteer board again as long as I live. Uh, they, uh, any, if you look at the career profile of any woman who has entered municipal politics, you will see a list as long as your arm in that regard. Uh, and uh, uh, guess what? Uh, I joined just over a year ago. I am now the president. And <laughs> that isn't a comment on me, believe me. It's a comment on getting involved in volunteer activity. Uh, it's, it's very small. It's a seven-member board. I will say an excellent board. Very talented people uh, with a diversity of interest. Uh, it gets $130,000 a year, which in the overall scheme of things is absolutely peanuts. For that, it pays for a personal, one personal support worker to work full time, nine to five. Uh, uh, we don't pay that person directly. The money goes to a contracted agency of the LIN, and then they supply the employee to us. And it has a communal space in one apartment building uh, provided by a residential landlord. Uh, the residential landlord is Homestead Land Holdings. The building is Bowling Green 2, which is one of four apartment buildings that were built all around the same time. Again, uh, uh, f for those of you perhaps new to Kingston, Bowling Green, the Bowling Green apartments are directly across the street from the great big law blahs, uh, uh, if that means anything. Okay. Uh, the point is, the buildings are not downtown. Uh, the buildings are relatively isolated. They're surrounded by very large arterial roads like Bath Road and uh, Sir John A. Macdonald Boulevard. Uh, but the, the big, the, a three-bedroom unit in one of those buildings is $1,200. Did I? Yeah, a month. Rent is $1,200 a month rent as opposed to what I told you about downtown. So you can see that the demographic who can afford to live in Bowling Green is quite different from the demographic that can afford to live downtown. So I preempted myself here uh, that uh, this Bowling Green 2 is full of very old, old people. Uh, uh, is full of oldest old people. And uh, the landlord is very cooperative in this instance and has actually directed people uh, to that site, or many of them have lived there for many years and have simply aged in place. Uh, 
the principle of uh, Oasis is that it is member driven. And the founder of this is a woman called Christine McMillan, who is now 86 years old, uh, who uh, retired from the Ontario Public Service and moved to Kingston and started the Council on Aging in Kingston. Christine is a firebrand who has never given up. And uh, I immediately think of uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who was accused by her Senate colleagues of being persistent. Uh, well, if they, if they knew Christine, she would be accused of exactly the same trait. She is persistent. Uh, and uh, she drums into any new board member that this is not us doing things for people. This is us facilitating an environment where people can do things for themselves. And because uh, our attitudes to the elderly are very patronizing. And that in itself is soul destroying in many circumstances. So uh, members run their own meetings. I've, uh, I, I'm newly minted president, attended my first members meeting and heard about various suggestions for programming that they would like to do. Uh, there is, I didn't mention it earlier, the 130,000 a year also covers subsidized meal program in one of the, bill, uh, one of the kitchen, uh, there's a commercial kitchen in one of the common rooms. And it's, it's social. Uh, Meals on Wheels is great, but it's still delivering a meal to somebody sitting in their own apartment all by themselves. Uh, th the issue of communal dining, which I have uh, attended and observed, is people eat a really good three-course meal that is catered, and then a whole bunch of them sit down afterwards and play cards together. It's quite a different environment. So the philosophy of Oasis is what I've written there. It's addressing physical fitness, it's addressing nutrition, it's reducing isolation, and it's the PSW, the pub, uh, personal support worker, is a wonderful person who's worked there for years, who watches these people very, very carefully. They have uh, morning coffee. She'll tell me that if she sees somebody who's not quite well, uh, she will diplomatically intervene. Uh, if people who are regular suddenly don't show up, she'll go up to their apartment and find out what's going on. If people get cold or don't feel particularly well, she'll ensure that the meal is delivered to their unit. Uh, as Christine says to us, the alternative for this is a bunch of old women living in apartments eating toast and jam for supper every night. And after a while, uh, that uh, doesn't do them any good. So the landlord wants the program to expand. And of course, Homestead is a huge landlord. They, don't, they own many, many rental buildings in Kingston. But not only that, they own rental buildings all over the province of Ontario. One, uh, a great uh, local entrepreneurial success story. Uh, the landlord loves Oasis and wants it to continue and prosper. In fact, he has agreement to build a new building in the same area behind uh, uh, Heathfield, which is uh, a former nunnery, well, it's still a nunnery, but they have a huge tract of land which they, uh, the nuns who remain, want uh, to be used fruitfully, and that is where the hospice, I understand, is to be built. But they uh, also will have an apartment building, and they are specifying that there must be an OASIS program in that building. Uh, the landlord is more than happy to cooperate. What has the landlord discovered? Uh, that uh, the turnover rate uh, is lower in Bowling Green too than any of his other similar apartment buildings. Uh, his uh, superintendent doesn't get nearly as many complaints because people aren't nearly as crabby and miserable. And uh, prospective tenants, uh, there's a waiting list. Uh, people have heard about Oasis through word of mouth, and they're saying they want to live there. Uh, and uh, again, uh, having gone for a meal, it's, you know, there are uh, a group of women, a few men, there are a couple of men usually show up, maybe three, but a lot more women. Uh, they, uh, they're volunteers for their own services. And so we have 92-year-old women going around serving food to other similarly aged women. 
So uh, that's the anecdotal evidence. There isn't a lot of measured evidence. We have to be much more rigorous in that, and that's what we're intending to do in the next little while uh, with support from the LEN. And that is uh, the VON uh, conducted an assessment of OASIS members uh, a few years ago and uh, discovered that in the OASIS bil building, Bowling Green 2, uh, they, uh, there is an inter-eye assessment tool that will decide uh, after you answered a number of questions, both health and social, uh, about your circumstances, whether you're eligible for long-term care or not. And uh, the assessment applied uh, to OASIS members found 11 said, yes, uh, we're qualified to enter long-term care, but we don't want to. And so uh, as a result, uh, I, I don't know how much home care is costing for those women, but it's a significant saving. If we could replicate the OASIS concept in many more similar buildings, uh, we can see an appreciable savings in long-term care. So uh, nothing is good forever. Uh, nothing stays static forever. Uh, so uh, what we have with OASIS is the, the women in particular who have hung in there for many years and who are in their 90s now. Uh, and uh, no matter how great OASIS is, there may come a day when they may not be able to stay in their units. Uh, and their newer members coming up, I said word of mouth about OASIS has got around. We have examples of people uh, who are asking to be able to locate in that building for especially to take advantage of that program. I can cite uh, one example of a couple where uh, the woman has recently been diagnosed with early Alzheimer's and uh, they want to be able to live independently as possible and they have chosen the OASIS location. Uh, so, um, uh, but what are the safeguards to expansion of OASIS, i.e., uh, Christine will say over and over again, it's not a viable work model if we try to do too much for people. We have to be the constant, almost invisible presence for people to do things for themselves and for people to socialize for themselves and make uh, decisions. How can we keep that alive? Uh, we did, it was kept alive by the fact that Christine McMillan lived in Bowling Green too. This is the mammoth change. I don't live there. Uh, so we need to reconstruct to be able to continue to make the model work. And whoops, oh, I think I've got the old one here. I had a couple of slides at the end. Oh, timing's perfect, but we've missed uh, I, I just wanted to talk about, no Celia, that's fine, don't worry. I just wanted to talk about uh, OASIS being a, um, a laboratory experiment as well. There's an organization connected to the University Health Network in Toronto called Open Lab. And Open Lab uh, has two trillion grants running at the moment. One is a exploration of the OASIS model. Uh, is, does anything like it exist anywhere else in North America? Uh, if it does, what does it look like? And is it better? Uh, what can we learn from it? What can we learn to make it better? The other uh, uh, Trillium Grant is going towards establishing an OASIS program in Toronto. Uh, why? Because Christine is, as I said earlier, I don't think she minds me saying, she's 86 years old. Uh, she's, uh, her uh, son lives in Toronto and he doesn't want her living on her own uh, in Kingston any longer. So he wants her to move into an apartment in Toronto. Well, Christine, uh, is great friends with Britt Smith, who's the owner of Homestead Lands Holdings. And uh, Britt loves Oasis. And Britt has said, I own, I don't know how many apartment buildings in Toronto, but it's not an insignificant number. And he's saying, uh, making a deal with Christine, that they find one of his buildings in Toronto to turn into an Oasis. 
Uh, so there is a Trillium grant through uh, the Open Lab uh, to find a building in Toronto that is suitable to start an oasis. Of course, it's easier to start it from scratch, right? Because then you could build a building to specs, so to speak. Uh, it's a bit more of a challenge to find an existing building that has adequate common room space and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so the deal is that one of the homestead buildings in Toronto will start an oasis and Christine will be living in that building. Uh, so uh, uh, the firebrand that she is will continue to do her good work. Now, my last slide, I'll have to tell you to go to the Open Lab site, uh, University Health Network Open Lab. It's very easy to find. Uh, the researchers on design. Uh, somebody's got their laptop open, you've already found it. Uh, the design team, there are pictures up of all of them. It is absolutely striking. The, the, uh, first of all, the leader of the design lab is, is a former director in the Ministry of Health. Uh, he's the only man in the group. But the, uh, the rest of the group, which is what, about six or seven people, I can't remember exactly, are all very young people, researchers, uh, except for one, and that's Christine McMillan. So uh, Open Lab has adopted Christine uh, for all the fabulous work that she has done. And uh, I can't think of any better photographic evidence of intergeneral, inter, intergenerational cooperation uh, than that, that series of photographs. Uh, so uh, that's the note I was going to end on, and I'm two minutes over. <laughs>